Israel, Britain and the Jews. They are three huge topics on their own, but three very interesting topics all the same. Particularly when we look at Britain and we look at Israel, very topical nations in the world today. Israel, as we know, is not very far from the headlines at any, any point in time, really. But when we consider Britain, that has also been in the news, particularly uh, during the past week for particularly sad reasons, but also in relation to their exit of the European Union. But tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we want to have a look at the relationship that Britain has with the nation of Israel. And not only that, we want to have a look at the link that exists between the plan and purpose that God has with the earth and the nation of Britain, and also the link that Israel has with the plan and purpose that God has with the earth. And the roles that these nations play in the course of events in the world has a direct bearing upon us. And so the way we wish to tackle that this evening is first to have a look at the plan and purpose that God has with the earth. And when we have an understanding of the plan that God has with the earth, we can see where God is heading when he intervenes in the nations around us. We then want to have a look at the Jews' rejection of the gospel. We'll have a look at what the gospel is, and then we'll have a look at what the, how the Jews rejected that, and the cause of events that stemmed from their rejection of the gospel. And then we want to have a look at Britain in the Bible and see how it is mentioned in the Bible and how Britain is used uh, in our current events to bring about the purpose of God. And we then want to have a look at the restoration of the Jews to the land of Israel. And once we have done that, we'll have a look at Britain's future role that it has in the plan and purpose of God and finally how it applies to us. So first of all, the plan and purpose that God has with the earth. And in Numbers chapter 14 and at verse 21, it says, As truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. So what does that mean? Well, it means that God has an end vision for the earth. And that vision is to populate the earth with a group of people who display his character. To have a group, an earth full of a group of people who think like God and act as God would act. And in Isaiah chapter 45 and at verse 18, we read, For thus saith the Lord God that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth, and made it, he hath established it, he created it not in vain, but he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is none else. And so that is the plan and purpose that God has with the earth, and he began that plan and purpose nearly 6,000 years ago. And we will find as we start going through the scriptures that that plan and purpose is being worked out to this very day. And what we want to find out is how Britain and Israel are involved in that plan. The gospel itself is contained in Numbers chapter 14 and at verse 21. It is the plan and purpose God has with the earth. And how he intends to do that is by offering the gospel to mankind that they may be a part of that plan and purpose. And it was offered to the Jews first of all. And if you would come with me to Romans chapter 1, we read there in verse 16 these words. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 it says, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, or we can say the non-Jew, any population that is non-Jewish. So the gospel was first offered to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. 
And it was first offered to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 7 in the form of a promise. And God said that I will give you this land if you do whatever I command you. And what we find is that through the course of events, through the history of Israel, they have rejected that offer. They have rejected the gospel as it was given to them by God. And as a result of that, ladies and gentlemen, they were scattered throughout the earth. They were dispersed right throughout the globe. And that is because they rejected the gospel and that resulted in them crucifying their own Messiah. That was the extent to which they rejected the gospel. And so the Jews were scattered throughout the earth for their wickedness. And this was foretold by Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 31 and at verse 28. If you would turn there for a moment. In Deuteronomy chapter 31 and at verse 28, we read, Gather unto me all the elders of your tribes and your officers, that I may speak these words in their ears and call heaven and earth to record against them. For I know... This is Moses speaking. For I know that after my death ye will utterly corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you and evil will befall you in the latter days because ye will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. And Moses spake in the ears of all the congregation of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. And that prophecy came true, didn't it? The the Jews were dispersed right throughout the grove. And it was also foretold by the greater Moses, even the Lord Jesus Christ himself, in the Gospel of Luke. In Luke chapter 19, we read there in the 41st verse, it says... And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children with thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. And they have been scattered throughout the world for centuries, ladies and gentlemen. In fact, you could arguably say they are the most persecuted nation on earth. And probably the pinnacle of that is the uh, German Holocaust. As a, as a prime example. But God has not forsaken this people. The Jews, ladies and gentlemen, are God's chosen race. And any nation that is mentioned in the Bible has a link or an indirect link to this nation in some shape or form. They are mentioned in the Bible because they have shaped the history of Israel in some way. And we will see that particularly with Britain. If you come with me to Isaiah chapter 63 for a moment, we will see an example that the Jews are God's chosen race. Joel chapter 3, verse 16. It says, The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. And if you come back with me to Leviticus chapter 26, we can see a promise. In Leviticus chapter 26 and in verse 44, we read, And yet for all of that, for all that they've done, 
when they be in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away, neither will I abhor them, to destroy them utterly, and to break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. But I will for their sakes remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the heathen, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. And so we have this promise that the children of Israel will not be forsaken. They will be cared for by God. And if you come with me to uh, Jeremiah chapter 31, we can see that God is going to bring them back into their homeland. In Jeremiah chapter 31, in verse 10, Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him, and keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. And so, ladies and gentlemen, God is going to bring the nation of Israel back into their homeland, which is the nation of Israel. And how is he going to do that? Well, enter Britain. You see, Britain helped facilitate the homecoming of the Jews. And God used Britain to bring about or to facilitate that uh, homecoming that they performed. So where is Britain mentioned in the Bible? Well, I'd like you to come with me to Genesis chapter 10 for a moment. In Genesis chapter 10, we have the first mention of the nation of Britain. And we read there in verse 1 of Genesis chapter 10, Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And unto them were sons born after the flood. So what we have here, ladies and gentlemen, is we have Noah and we have his three sons. And before we go into their genealogies, let's just come back to Genesis chapter 6. Because Genesis chapter 6 is the beginning of this story. It has for us the time when violence had completely filled the earth and all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said to Noah in verse 13 of chapter 6, he said, the end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And so the violence had got so great in the earth that God decided to flood the earth and start again. And his plan in doing so was to save Noah and his family. Noah and his three sons and their wives and every kind of animal. And in verse 18, God gives us this plan and he says, But with thee, Noah, will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee, and of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female, of fowls after their kind, and of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind. Two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. And take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. And thus did Noah, according to all that God had commanded him, so did he. And so God commands all of those animals and Noah's family to enter the ark so that once the flood came upon the earth and the waters had assuaged, Noah's family could repopulate the earth. And so in Genesis chapter 10, we now have the genealogies of the sons that were born to Noah's sons post the flood. And so the sons of Japheth, verse 2, he had Gomer and Magog and Madai and Javan and Tubal and Meshach 
and Tyrus. And so the sons of Javan were Elisha, verse 4, and Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. And it is there, ladies and gentlemen, that we have the first mention of the name of Tarshish. And it's referenced some 20 times in the Bible. And I have those references listed for you on the overhead. Now we've had a look at Genesis chapter 10, verses 2 to 5, which lists the genealogies, which of course Tarshish was among those genealogies. But now let's have a look at 2nd of Chronicles chapter 9 and at verse 21. Back in the, in the days of King Solomon. For the king's ships, that is Solomon's ships, went to Tarshish with the servants of Huram. Every three years once came the ships of Tarshish bringing gold and silver, ivory, <laughs> apes and peacocks. The second example I'd like to take you to is in Jonah chapter 1. In verse 1, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. And so God commanded Jonah to go to Nineveh and deliver a prophecy that if they didn't sort out their sins and their wickedness, they were going to be destroyed. But Jonah didn't want to do that. And he rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and he went straight down to Joppa. And he got on a ship and headed for Tarshish. And he found a ship going to Tarshish, verse 3, so he paid the fare thereof, he went down into it to go uh, with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And so obviously the quickest way to Tarshish for Jonah was to get on a ship and uh, go down to Joppa, which is the modern day Jaffa, and head straight west around to Tarshish. And if you do that and head slightly north, you come to Great Britain. And when we consider that nation of Great Britain, they are completely surrounded by sea. And all of their trade was born upon the sea. But Britain is known for its ship's prowess. It always has been. In the late 1800s, its naval power was incredible. And the tonnage of ships that was launched back in the late 1800s was more than all of the other nations in the world put together. And the third example that I'd like to show you is an extract from the British Museum of an inscription from King Esardon. And he reigned between 681 and 669 BC. And the inscription, it reads as follows. All the kings um, from the lands surrounded by sea, from the country... Cyprus, Iadanana, and Laman, or the Ionian Islands, as far as Tarshish, bowed to my feet. Now that's interesting, because A, it tells us that Tarshish was an actual place. Secondly, it tells us that it was a land surrounded by sea. And how many nations do you have that are completely surrounded by sea? And thirdly, he lists those countries firstly as Cyprus and then further west you come to the Ionian Islands and you go further west again, guess where you come to? You come to Great Britain. And so there's a few examples there why how we can prove that Tarshish is actually Great Britain. And so Britain is mentioned as we said in the Bible and it does have some links to the purpose that God has with his nation, the Jews. Because in, <coughs> because in 1917, Great Britain uh, launched the Balfour Declaration. And the Balfour Declaration, and we have it there on the screen, and it says, Dear Lord Rothschild, I have much pleasure in conveying to you 
on behalf of His Majesty's Government the following declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations which has been submitted to and approved by the Cabinet. His Majesty's Government view with favour the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavours to facilitate the achievement of this object. It being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by the Jews in any other country. I should be grateful if you would bring this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation. And so we can see God at work amongst the nations in providing a homeland for his own people. It is fulfilling the prophecy that God has said he would never forsake his people. The only problem is, at this point in time, in 1917, we don't actually yet have a nation. But that occurred in 1948. The nation of Israel...